Welcome to another video. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, the kind of stuff that you might need when you're getting started with building terrain. And we're going to talk about prices as well, which I think is really important. See you after this. Okay, this video came about from one of um, my subscribers asking the question in the comments, really, talking about they want to get started in building terrain, um, but it's it's quite difficult, I think, sometimes to find out how much you need, how much stuff costs, whether it's essential, whether you really need it, whether you can get away with um, less. You know, there are some fantastic terrain makers out there, but mostly we, don't, you know, they don't talk about how much things cost, which is quite important when you're getting started out. You know, it's, it's how how much is this going to cost me to get started with this hobby. And the stuff I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to break it down into sections um, and I'm going to give my kind of recommended, if you have to buy only one from each section, which one would I buy? Um, I'll talk about the costs of everything. I'm wary to use words like essential. Whenever you get into stuff like this, what is essential for me won't be essential for you or for a load of other people out there. So kind of, I'm going to talk through the use cases for each thing and why I think they are essential for me, what I, if I could go back in time to when I first started building terrain, what I wish I would knew to buy first, if that makes sense. And again, it might change if you're looking to build buildings and houses, the stuff you will find useful will be completely different to the stuff if you are going out to build big boards or terrain or dioramas. So I'll, I'll kind of talk about all of that as well. Um, like I said, I'll break it down into sections. I'd love to hear anything that I've missed in the comments below, what you think I've missed, what you think you can add to it. If there are cheaper options available, that that's always great. I will do a section at the end where I kind of talk about free or very, very cheap um, things that you can use as well. So stick around for that. And let's get on with the first section. Okay, glues are essential. Okay, I'm going to put that word out there now. I know I says I'm going to use it, but you will need some way of sticking one piece to another piece. And there are loads of different glues out there. Honestly, you can spend more on glues than on anything else. I'm going to go through the different types of glue that you're probably going to come across that you might think, do I need that? Do I not need that? I'll talk about why you might need each one. And hopefully we'll get a little bit of clarity by the end as to where you might want to spend your money. Um, the first thing is something like this, a glue gun, okay? I really like having a glue gun. Um, I haven't put this as an essential in this section, though, because they are probably one of the more expensive types of glue. I mean, you can get one like this for about £18 from Amazon. Um, I'm going to use pounds because I'm in England. Um, you know, you can convert to dollars or, or whatever, or euros. Um, but it's roughly £18 for this one. Now, what I like about this one and what I recommend you get is that it is dual temperature. So you can see here, you can switch between um, low temperature and high temperature. I generally pretty much run it on low temperature all of the time. Occasionally, you need high temperature. But if you run it on high temperature, it will melt um, foam when you're doing that. And I've got a section on foam later on. So you want one with dual setting. Um, you can get the glue sticks really cheap as well online. You know, you can get 50 for, I don't know, 10 pounds, something like that. They're not expensive at all. So the glue gun itself is about 18 pounds, 18 to 20 pounds. You can spend a lot more. Um, you might be able to pick up a cheaper one somewhere like Aldi or Lidl or something like that. You can get one in the middle aisle, but I don't think 18 to 20 pounds really is too much. I use this a lot. I use it all the time. Um, more for building buildings. If you are building terrain board, you probably won't use it as much, um, but you might still need it for sticking down things. Uh, it's good for sticking uh, rock molds onto walls and on, onto polystyrene and things like that. So definitely something to think about. If you're going to get two glues, I would make a glue gun the second one that you get. Um, the most common type of glue that you will probably know is uh, PVA glue, like this one. And this is five litres. I've known how much this cost. This was from B&Q here in the UK. Um, this has been passed around from my dad to my brother, uh, my sisters, my brother-in-laws, um, and to me. So I've no idea how much it cost. Um, 
you know, you can get a litre maybe for £10 from Amazon. You can get it a lot cheaper. It's, I would imagine this was probably about £20, £25 for five litres. You want the strong stuff if you're going to use PVA. Don't use the school glue um, or the cheap £1 for a litre stuff from the works. I recommend a lot of stuff from places like the works or Poundland or Wilco's, but not this stuff. Um, get the strong PVA if you're going to use it. I don't use PVA very much at all. I don't like PVA. It reactivates quite easily with water and things like that. Yeah, so it becomes tacky again. It shrinks a lot when it dries. So if you're painting cardboard with it or you know anything flimsy, it, as it shrinks, it, it bows and bends things. I don't particularly like PVA. A lot of people use watered down PVA for sealing things onto their bases, sealing things like gravel and sand and grit and things like that, which apparently works well. I'll talk about my method later on, or my method, the method that I use that I got from somebody else. PVA you can get, you can use. I don't recommend it. Um, I, I don't particularly use PVA. Instead, I use Mod Podge. Now, you'll have heard, probably heard of Mod Podge. It is... Um, a mix of it's a water-based glue but it also contains a sealant which i believe is a type of resin mixed in with it this doesn't shrink at all it's more expensive than the pva it's about eight pounds to ten pounds for this kind of half a litre 473 mil um jar or tub but it is well worth it you can mix it with paint to paint uh, to seal foam and things like that um this is what I've put as my essential glue in the or my recommended glue. If you're only going to buy one glue, I would buy Mod Podge. It works like PVA, so you can stick cardboard and things like that together. It sticks foam together and things like that. The other thing I should say about PVA is that PVA needs air to dry. Um, so if you're gluing two pieces of big foam, two big pieces of foam together, like on a board or something like that, it will take PVA a long time to dry. Okay, like you're talking days. Um, Mod Podge is quicker. It's still not quick. If you're going to stick um, pieces, big pieces of foam together, I would use contact adhesive, something like um, no nails or Gorilla Glue or something like you know the stuff that comes in the long tubes um, with the um, guns you get, like sealant, like silicon, and things like that. I haven't actually got any here with me to show here because I didn't think about that. But yeah, if you're going to stick big pieces of foam together, get contact adhesive rather than trying to use Mod Podge or PVA. It'll be a waste of Mod Podge, and it'll take ages to dry with PVA. So Mod Podge, if you are going to get it and you're getting it for terrain, make sure you get the matte one, which is the yellow one here in the UK. I assume it's the same internationally. The red one is gloss, so it will dry with a big shine to it, which does have its use. Um, you can use it for water effects and things like that for waves. But for most of your terrain stuff, you will want the matte finish. Okay, so that is my recommended for this. It's about eight to 10 pounds um, for this kind of size. Another glue, of course, that you might need is super glue. I always use this GH1200 um, stuff because I bought it in bulk from Amazon. Um, is You can get it for about £4 a tub like this. I think I paid a little bit less per tub. I think I bought um, five of these for, a lot. I think it worked out about £2.50 each. It was about £12, £12.50, something like that for five of them. Any super glue will do. Um, gel super glue is thicker. Um, so it kind of holds things in place. That's more important if you're doing minis. But you might use this to kind of stick down um, rocks and things like that, you know, stones and things like that to your base. But super glue isn't necessarily essential really for terrain making. You can use it to stick buildings together. I would tend to go for a hot glue gun before I went for super glue. If I was sticking foam together on a corner, it'll give you a stronger bond. Super glue has a tendency to melt foam. Um, unless you get foam safe super glue, uh, which is more expensive. So super glue is handy, it's more important for models than it is for terrain making. But if you are gonna get it, I would definitely get an activator with it, which is another five pounds or so. Um, the activator just speeds up, so it dries in seconds. So you put the super glue on, spray the activator either on the opposite surface or onto the join when it's connected. Um, and then it, like I say, it, dry, it sets in seconds. Um, you can do the same thing just by sprinkling baking powder on it as well. Uh, I've never done that, but I've seen videos where they do it. I just use the activator. And again, that's about £5 for a can like this, or you can bulk buy it um, and pay less per can. Um, I tend to get through quite a lot because I glue together a lot of minis with it. So for glues, my recommended 
is definitely matte Mod Podge. I would go for first. If you are going to get two, and I would recommend getting two in this case, get yourself a dual temperature hot glue gun. It sticks what this doesn't. With these two, if you've got these two, you can't really go wrong. Pretty much everything that you'll need to stick will stick. When it comes to cutting things, um, there are lots of different ways and it depends what you're going to be cutting. I would definitely, I mean, mine's absolutely filthy, but I would definitely recommend getting something like this, a cutting mat. This one's um, roughly a three size, something like that. Um, I would get a cutting mat. It will protect your surfaces. It's definitely worth getting. Um, and I would get a good knife. So this was about five pounds um, from Wilco's. Now they're just going into administration, but you can find cheaper one, uh, find cheap ones like that around. Um, it's one that you can change the blades on. Um, it, you can see how dirty and battered it is. They, they get gunked up, they get cut up. Don't spend loads on a knife. You can get the ones with the snap off blades, the really cheap ones from Poundland, they're absolutely fine. All you need is a sharp blade. And I say that obviously, you know, it seems obvious with a knife you need a sharp blade, but you'll need a lot of blades. If you are cutting foam, in particular if you're cutting XPS, which we'll get to in a bit, it will dull the blade really quickly. So you will get through them. Um, bulk buy them where you can. Um, you know, the snap off blades are quite good for that because you can just snap off the end and, and use them. I tend to use this one. It doesn't have a particularly long blade, which can be a bit cumbersome if you're cutting through thick polystyrene. Um, but for cutting through cardboard or plastic or things like that, this absolutely does the job. It's not difficult um, to cut through. Uh, it's got a nice grip, which is really, really important. I find the thin snap-off blades um, too thin. I find they hurt my hand when I'm trying to cut for any length of time. Uh, like I said, this was a couple of quid, maybe five pounds, something like that. Snap-off blades are even cheaper. So I would say that a blade like this is definitely kind of a requirement you will need some form of cutting tool to cut through whether it's um, to cut through um, things like coffee stirrers you might use um, pin snips or some uh, metal uh, tin snips sorry not pin snips tin snips um, you can even use scissors and things like that but having something like this makes it a lot easier okay so that, that's my recommended in this state another thing to think about if you are going to be cutting, this is more specialist, but if you're going to be cutting lots and lots of coffee stirrers or lollipop sticks or strip wood or things like that, getting something like this, which as you can see, just has a, a blade there. Let's see if we can see it in the camera up there. It just uses a, 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 um, a sharp razor blade and it just allows you to guillotine and cut down. This was about 15 pounds from Amazon. You can buy them in various places. You can set the angles. Something for further down the line, but definitely if you're going to be cutting lots and lots of coffee stars for floorboards or for shingles or for roofing or buildings, something like this is going to save you a lot of time further down the line. If it's cutting polystyrene that you want to do, then you'll need a hot wire cutter, at least in the near to medium term. You can get ones like this, which are just a simple metal um, rod that gets really hot and you can use to carve and cut and things like that. Useful, really easy, heats up really quickly, um, not very expensive. These, this was about £15. Um, you can get ones that kind of branch out to a wire and have a wire in between them, which you can use to gouge um, more kind of chunks out rather than this one. They're probably about double the price. They're about £30. I don't have one of those yet. That might be my next purchase. I would quite like one. Um, and they're about £30 for something like that. The biggest cost, but something that I would really, really recommend if you can afford it, perhaps a little bit further down the line, if you are going to be cutting a lot of polystyrene or a lot of foam, especially if you're cutting things like bricks where you're just doing the same um, movement over and over and over again, a hot wire cutter table like this, I, I would definitely recommend. Now, Proxon is kind of the go-to brand that you'll see everybody using. I couldn't afford a Proxon when I went for it there, you know, about £150, something like that. I couldn't justify that. I went for this one by Vivor or Vevor or something like that. I can't find it any more available. Um, it was about £80 new. You can get them on eBay for about £65 secondhand. But there are other brands out there that are very similar. At the end of the day, all it is is a hot wire, and that's it. Um, Proxons come, you can get more attachments for Proxons, but it's not difficult to craft them if you need for this one. This comes with a circular attachment to cook circles out. Um, 
and it comes with a a um, guide that you can put on there. I've just not brought them on to kind of keep the table less cluttered. If you can afford one further down the line, get one of these. It will save you so much time. If you're cutting bricks, you can set up the rack like you've seen in my videos and just run off the foam over and over and over and over again until you've got a thousand bricks. You don't have to measure everything. You don't have to sit there with a knife. It will just save you so much time if you're going to cut that amount of foam down the line. But for now, to get started, I would say a good knife is, is about all you need, really. Something like this will cut foam, it will cut cardboard, it will cut plastic, it will do everything you need to do. It might just take you a bit longer. So to get started, I'm going to put that as about five pounds, and that should be a good start for cutting. Paints are one of the things that you are going to use the most, whether you're building terrain forms or whether you're building buildings, you're going to need a lot of paint. So my biggest recommendation when it comes to paints is buy cheap paints that you get a lot of. I use these kinds, so like the Graduate or the Crawford and Black. These, um, I think I got this one from, I think the Graduate range comes from the, the range shop called The Range. Um, and they're about four pounds each, three pounds, 54 pounds. The Crawford and Black ones come from the works and uh, they're two pounds. I think they might be three pounds now. I've had this one a while, you know, inflation. Um, but, you know, two to three pounds, something like that for these. You are going to get through a lot. I would get, you know, just a couple of maybe a brown, a yellow, a black and a white and probably a grey. Um, so total cost for paints really only needs to be about £10 and that should last you quite a while, especially if you're only doing buildings. If you're doing big um, boards, it might not last you quite as long. Um, the other option is to use spray paints, uh, rattle cans as I think they're referred to as well in the US. I love the high coat range um, of car primers. These are about £6 for a tin from the range about the same from Amazon. Um, you can get them in lots of different colours. I tend to use the grey, the black and the white the most. I also use those for priming minis as well. They work really well for that. They work really well for base coats on terrain or on buildings. If you see me priming anything in any of my videos, I tend to use the black high coat. Um, I do quite like this range, the 151 range, which is from Poundland here in the UK. I'm sure there are equivalents everywhere. These are about £2.50 for a tin, but they do only come in grey, white and black and it's quite hard I've found to get them consistently so at the minute they've only got the one they made has only got white gloss they haven't got any white matte um, and they haven't got any grey at all but they have got some black so paints you want something that's going to give you a lot of paint cheaply because you're going to get through it. and the same goes for paint brushes you can see here um, hopefully you can see on the camera up here the, the state of the bristles on this brush you're not treating a brush kindly when you're painting terrain with it. Don't buy expensive brushes. You don't even need the big ones from like B&Q or, or proper like emulsion brushes for painting your house. A set containing this kind of brush from the works was about five pounds. And that included five or six different brushes, including some sponge brushes that are quite good for stippling and different effects. But what you want are these quite wide tipped ones. You don't really need any wider than this, which is about an inch. Um, because and maybe two inch if you're doing lots of terrain, the same if you're doing lots of brown. I tend to find um, the inch ones are, are kind of the right size for what I try and do. Don't buy expensive ones. Get the cheapest brushes you can because, you, like I say, you will absolutely destroy them. Um, so, And that's really all you need for paints. Don't use, if you can help it, don't use your model paints. I know it might seem cheaper in the short term, and you go, oh, I've got all these model paints, like the Citadel paints or Army paints or whatever. It may seem like, well, I've got them, I may as well use them, but you'll get through them so quickly, and they are so expensive. When you think a Citadel paint is, I don't know, £4, £55 now, and they're so small compared to something this size, maybe £2, £3, it just it doesn't make financial sense to use your model paints. Okay, I sometimes use the silvers if I want to dry brush something on a building or dry on a terrain. Um, but even for dry brushing rocks and things like that, I will reach for a grey or a white from this rather than from the, the, the model paints because it just isn't worth it cost-wise. Okay, so my essential for that would probably be the craft paints um, rather than the rattle cans. I do like rattle cans. I use them a lot. 
But if you're just going to buy one type of paint, get these cheap paints from, like I said, the works, wherever, and make them, you know, kind of your go-to paint for terrain building. Let's talk about foam. Let's talk about foam. Baby. There are really two different types of foam that you'll come across in the terrain making hobby, whether you're building landforms or whether you're building buildings. Um, the first one is expanded polystyrene, which is the white stuff. It's got all the it's made up of all these tiny balls, and this is the kind of stuff that equipment comes packaged in when you buy electronic equipment, TV or printer or whatever. It comes packed in this kind of stuff. It has. A, a squidge to it. It's got a little bit of give in it. Uh, it's got a horrible squeak when you do it. When you break it, it tends to send bits everywhere. This stuff is not very good for texturing. Okay, you can't make a mark in it. You can't texture it with a roller. You can't carve bricks into it. It doesn't leave a very nice surface when you cut it, even with a hot wire cutter. But it is great for packing out. So if you are building a big hill or you're building a big piece of terrain, you'll see in my latest video where I'm building the Necrom underboard, I use this stuff underneath the tiles that I've cast because it's cheap, it's very light, and if all you need is something to just fill a gap, this stuff is great. Um, and you can get it for free whenever you get anything, um, when you buy anything electronic normally. So it's worth hanging on to. Um, but don't use this for carving or for kind of um, a finished product. It needs something on top of it. So if you're going to use it as a hill or something like that, you'll probably put sculpt mold on it or a modeling compound or something like that, or a, a plaster mix to protect it, to stop it. I built um, one of my first boards using this and then covered it with plaster, uh, not plaster, with um, filler, which I think you Americans call spackle. And... It looked great at the beginning, but because it has got that give in it, the, the, the filler started to bend and crack and chip, and it need, now needs a lot of touching back up. So you do need a good strong coating on it if you're going to use it for that, but that isn't to say don't use it. It is good foam. Um, the other stuff is this, which is extruded polystyrene. So expanded, extruded. And extruded is the XPS stuff that you will see most terrain makers use. Now, the problem with XPS is that it is really difficult to get hold of in the UK. Um, overseas, they use it a lot more for house insulation. Here in the UK, we don't. We tend to use things like Kingspan, which is the stuff you'll see with the silver lining on it. Don't use that. It doesn't take a, um, a, a texture um, any better than the white stuff. It breaks up really easy into like a horrible powder. And you, because it's heat resistant, you can't cut it with a hot wire cutter. Just Give it a swerve. Don't touch the Kingspan or Celotex or any of that kind of silverback stuff. You want XPS. Now, in the UK, you can get it normally in like the 6 mil thickness stuff as underfloor insulation um, or laminate floor insulation, and that's fine if you just want the 6 mil stuff. The thicker stuff, I've found you have to go to specialist insulation companies or on eBay. Um, I paid around £12 per sheet for a 1200 by 600 millimeter sheet on eBay. The problem is you have to order five sheets at once. Most have a minimum of five sheets orders. So that was £60 for the XPS, but I've got more XPS than I need for now. So I've got a lot to last me, but it is a big initial outlay, which is really frustrating because like I say, in the US, um, you can just kind of go into any DIY store, it seems, and buy it, whereas you can't here in the UK. And that was for 30 mil thick stuff. I didn't go for the 50 mil thick because I kind of figured, well, if I need 50 mil, I can just put two 30 mils on top of each other or cut it down or whatever. So XPS is the best stuff because this you can carve, you can engrave, you can put a texture roller over it. It's stiff. It has very little give in it. It's really strong, really tough. But it is very hard to get hold of in the UK, or it can be quite expensive to get hold of in the UK. The other thing to remember is that if you are using rattle cans like these, it doesn't matter which foam you are using, the solvent in the rattle can, not the paint, but the solvent in the rattle can, the, the, the actual spray bit, will melt polystyrene, will melt both types of foam if you spray it too close. That's why I coat everything in Mod Podge first, because Mod Podge gives it a protective layer before you hit it with the rattle can. You can spray it from further away and try and find that balance. I'm not very good at finding the balance. I always end up melting a little bit of it anyway. 
The other thing you might see is foam core, which tends to be ex very thin XPS, maybe three mil XPS sandwiched between two sheets of cardboard. I use it occasionally. It's quite good for building walls. It does have a very shiny finish on it. There is a um, foam core that you can get in America, but I've not seen it in the UK where you can easily peel off the paper and then use the XPS foam underneath. I've not found any like that in the UK. It seems really hard to peel off, so I just don't bother with it. I tend to use the XPS. But if you do want foam core, you can get that for about a pound per A3 sheet on Amazon if you buy in bulk. So I think that came out at about 16 pounds for 16 A3 sheets, something like that. Um, so that's worth looking into, but I would stick, if you can, to XPS, um, like I say, £12 a sheet, but you do generally have to buy five sheets at once, which makes it about £60. So it's quite a big expense. So if you can make the most of this stuff, do so. But if you want something that you need to carve or you want to build bricks or you want to put a text roller on, you're going to need XPS. That's pretty much the stuff that I think you'll need to get started. Okay, you'll need a good glue. You'll need a good cutter. Um, you will need, pr probably need some foam of some kind if you're going to make big terrain, like landscapes. If you're going to make buildings, you don't need that. We'll come to that in the free stuff in a minute. Um, but that's kind of it. You'll need some paints. So if you've got the cheap paints, you've got the cheap cutter, like a cheap knife or something like that. If you've got um, something like Mod Podge, and if you've got, um, a cheap, so what did I say? So you need cheap glue, cheap paint, cheap um, building material, whether it's foam or whatever, and then cheap cutter. Those four things will pretty much get you started. Okay, the other kind of stuff that you might want further down the line, and I've put that here just so that I can give you prices in case you're wondering. Um, you might want to do a resin pour. So if you want to do some deeper water, you might want a resin pour. So for two part resin, I kind of just use the cheap stuff from Amazon. You're looking at about £25 per litre. Um, if you want to make some silicon moulds, like I have been recently for my Necrom underboard, check out the video up here. Um, that's about £20 for half a litre-ish, give or take. Uh, I then used casting resin, so polyurethane resin. That's about £24 for a kilogram, um, which tends to go quite a long way. Uh, I did that whole necrom board with about a kilogram's worth. I know I ran out halfway through, but that was because I'd used half of it before. You might want something like sculptor mold or modeling compound. Um, now, sculptor mold is about 20 ish pounds per kilogram. Uh, modeling compound is about 12 pounds, I think, per kilogram, something like that. It's about half the price. I have got a video up here bing, where you can make your own um, using a new method that I've kind of figured out myself that doesn't use any toilet paper, which was a great relief to me. Um, and that's cheaper, a lot cheaper if you're doing it in bulk. Um, and then you might want a sealing solution. So when you put things like gravel or sand or grout or even things like static grass, which I've not even covered in this video, but if you want things like static grass on there, um, you want to seal it down. Once you've glued it down, you then want to seal it down because if people are playing on the boards or playing on the dioramas or, or the buildings, it will all come back off. Just glue underneath it is not enough. So you want to seal it down. And the first thing for that you'll need is isopropyl alcohol, which is about five to six pounds a litre, but you will only need a very small amount. Um, I have a bottle here um, and this, I fill this up, this is probably about 200 mil, maybe 100 mil. Yeah, it'll be 100 mil because it's an airport spray bottle, so it'll be 100 mil to get through the airport security. Um, and this lasts me a long time. Um, and the idea is with the isopropyl is that you spritz that over the stuff first and that breaks the surface tension. So then when you put your sealing solution on it, it flows down around everything and really locks it in tight. A lot of people use watered down PVA as their sealing solution. That seems to work really well. I don't like, like I said, I don't like PVA. I tend to use a mix of Mod Podge and Matte Sealant, which you can get again from the range. It's just like the artist sealant that they sell there, like the Matte Varnish. Um, so I matte, va matte varnish, matte Mod Podge, and then watered down. And that works really well. But you can use watered down PVA if you want to. I just don't like PVA glue. But they're all things that you might use further down the line. You'll want to have some way of sealing it, but if you've got Mod Podge or you've got PVA anyway, just water down some of that, spritz it. We'll get some isopropyl alcohol, which you can get from Amazon. You can get from most places like that. You can get it from B&Q, whatever. 
spritz that on it first, put water down glue, PVA or Mod Podge on, and that will lock everything in place. Okay, but these are all things that you might want further down the line. You don't need them now. You don't need them to get started. They look cool and they're the big kind of showstoppers that you see when we make terrain on these kind of channels. And I love doing resin. I love playing with like the molds and the casting, polyurethane resin. But you don't need them. They're not anywhere near essential, okay, to get you started. Like I say, all you need, paint, a cutter, something to build with like a foam and a glue. That's all you need, okay? These are just good things for in the future. Right, I promised you a bit about what about cheap and free stuff. And there is so much cheap and free stuff that you can use for this hobby. Okay, if you are going to be building a, a building and you want um, bricks or something like that, you don't have to go out and buy a hot foam cutter and cut a thousand little bricks to stick onto something. You could build your um, house out of cardboard that you've got lying around. I wouldn't go for serial cardboard for the structure because it's a bit thin. But if you've got... Um, corrugated cardboard if you've got thicker cardboard use that to build the basic structure and then use um cereal card cereal box cardboard cut that out into squares stick that on and it will look like bricks it will look like a textured wall i guarantee you, i'm going to do um a build a video in the future looking at that um using something very similar and it will serve the same purpose it will look like bricks you just want that mm, that very shallow relief so you can use cardboard to build any kind of building that you want, really. Um, you know, look for things like scraps of wood that you've got lying around. If you've got thin plywood lying around or thin MDF lying around, um, that will make good bases for buildings. If you've got slightly thicker wood lying around, that would make a good base for a diorama. So you can use scraps of wood and things like that. Now, when you watch these videos, you might see people referring to chipboard. In the UK, what we what the Americans call chipboard, we call thick cardboard. It's the kind of stuff if you've got like um, a notepad or an A4 pad, you know that sheet of brown cardboard that's at the back of it? That's what they call chipboard. Over here in the UK, chipboard is a type of wood, um, a very thin kind of horrible wood that um, you wouldn't really use for any kind of crafting. So don't get confused with that. But you can get cardboard anyway. You can get cheap cardboard if you go to hobby craft shops. Um, you know, you can buy a pack of cardboard for like two pounds or a pound for loads of A4 sheets, really strong chipboard cardboard. Um, you cereal cardboard, you keep bits of plastic. If you buy, get blister packs, if your children get toys or if you get toys and you know, you, they come in all that horrible plastic, keep that because you can, you know, they make great windows. Um, any toys that you're going to throw away, especially anything that's got kind of a um, theme to it, like fantasy or medieval or futuristic keep those you never know what you might be able to take off it people like eric's hobby workshop is like the master of using toys to make amazing terrain so there is loads of stuff that you can get for free you can get sand and dirt from the garden and dry out some soil from your garden in the oven on a low temperature and use that for texturing your terrain or your terrain bases um sand from a sand pit dry it out again um old leaves and things like that you can scrunch leaves up and if you put them into a blender dried leaves will then become tiny tiny leaves that you can stick onto your terrain you don't have to go out and buy loads and loads of stuff okay if you're going to use like really cheap cardboard you if you're building buildings you don't really need any foam at all you won't need foam core you won't need xps you can just do it with cardboard that you can find box cardboard or chipboard so that makes it even cheaper so keep an eye out for those things when you are kind of in a craft shop, when you're in a hobby shop. Um, keep an eye out for tubes and things like that. Uh, so like Pringles tubes or the tubes from wrapping paper at Christmas. Um, all of those kind of things, they make great pipes. They make great towers. Um, and again, a Pringles tube, if you kind of stuck cereal cardboard around it, would do exactly the same job as if you're sticking XPS foam around it as well. So keep an eye out for all those things. There is loads of stuff. It doesn't have to cost you a fortune. Hopefully this video has been useful. As always, leave a comment, please. It, it, the more comments I get, the more worthwhile it seems making these videos. So like the video if you like it, um, share it, subscribe, do all of that kind of stuff. It really does make it worthwhile. Leave a comment if there's anything I've missed or if there's anything else you'd like to know about. I've not talked about things like static grass or stuff like that, but hopefully, you kind of get the idea of how much things cost. So hopefully it's not as expensive as you thought and you can get into it quite cheaply. As always, see you next time.